Welcome to video 8 in our series on tensor calculus. In this video, we're going to learn what it means to take the derivative of a position vector. We'll need this understanding as we develop a generalized basis for vector representation. Let's begin with a brief review of what it means to take the derivative of a function. Here I've got a simple function, and in the upper left-hand corner I've written down the definition of the derivative of a function. Let's put a point P on the curve, like this. And you'll notice as I move the point along the curve that the coordinate values of this point are displayed up here in the left-hand corner. The coordinate value simply being the value x, and the y value is the value of the function evaluated at x. Okay, now we will introduce a value of delta x. Right now it's set to the value of 1. And then we'll put another point on the curve, we'll call point Q, like this. Now point Q has coordinate values, first of all, of x plus delta x. So right now the value is 3. And the y value of point Q is the value of the function evaluated at x plus delta x. So as I move point P, point Q remains one unit to the right of point P, like this. Okay, now what I want to do is to draw a line through these two points, like this, and we want to see if we can calculate the slope of this line. Well, to do so, we will take a look at these segments. Here, the horizontal distance between the two points is, of course, just delta x, as we said. But the vertical distance between the two points is the difference between the y value of q and the y value of p. So this expression represents the vertical distance between the two points. This is the horizontal distance between the two points. And so we can now calculate the slope of the line like this. It is the ratio of the rise over the run. And as I move the points, you can see the slope changes, the, the line changes with it. All right, now to take the derivative, what I need to do is to uh, take this expression, this ratio, which you see in the definition, and I need to find its value when we take the limit of delta x to 0. And what that means is I'm going to gradually reduce the value of delta x. And as you can see, that brings the points closer together. And as they get closer together, the slope of the line changes until the line approaches and finally becomes tangent to the curve. So here the value of delta x is so small that we can't distinguish it from the value of 0. It's infinitesimally small. And if I take off some of the labels here, like this, this, and uh, then uh, as I move the point, you'll see that the line is now the tangent to the curve. And the slope of this line is what we mean by the derivative of the function. It is this value, this ratio, where we take the limit of delta x to 0. That is, delta x becomes infinitesimally small, and thus the line becomes a tangent, and the slope of the tangent line is the derivative of the function. Now let's take a look at how a similar process applies to vectors. In the upper left-hand corner, I've written down the definition for the derivative of a vector. And you'll notice that it has exactly the same form as the definition for the derivative of a simple function. Instead of using the function f, we're using the vector r. And instead of x and delta x, we're using s and delta s. Otherwise, the formula is exactly the same. All right, let's begin by selecting a point in our three-dimensional space that we'll call the origin. 
And then I will introduce a curve like this. And this particular curve I'm using as an example is a helix. And I'll move it around a little so you can get the idea of the three-dimensional nature that we're dealing with here. And then um, on this uh, curve, I'm going to select uh, a point. It's an arbitrary point. We'll call S sub 0. And we're going to measure distance along the curve, the arc length along the curve, with a variable called S. And S is simply going to be the distance along this curve beginning at s sub 0 and we'll measure s positively in this direction and negatively in this direction. s then becomes the independent variable for our formula. When we say r of s, s is the, the variable upon which our vector depends. Okay, now as we build up this formula, then we next need to, to put our vector r and vector r is what we call a position vector. And that's simply a vector that originates at our origin. Again, this is an arbitrary location. And the vector points to a point on our curve. Now, right now, it's pointing at s sub 0 because the value of s is 0. But if I vary the value of s, you'll notice that the vector moves along the curve. As s becomes positive, the point of the vector sweeps out in a forward direction. You can sweep it backwards. And when it gets to negative values, it's going in this direction. So this is what we mean by the value of the vector r being dependent on s. The point where the vector touches the curve is dependent upon the value of s. Therefore, the vector r is a function of s, the arc length of this curve. OK, I'm going to introduce uh, analogous to what we did before. I'm now going to introduce a quantity called delta s. And right now, delta s is set to a value of 4. And we'll now put another vector on the screen like this. And this is the vector r, which is dependent upon s plus delta s. OK, you see how this is analogous to the process we were doing before. Now I'm going to move it back a little. You'll see as I move the value of s, the two vectors move in tandem, just like the two points moved in tandem in the previous example. And right now, the value of delta s is set to 4. And that means that the arc length between this point and this point is 4 units. They're separated by 4 units. And like uh, before, I can change the value of delta s. And as I do, the points get closer together and farther apart. OK, now we're, we're working to build up this formula. So right now, we've got r of s plus delta s. So we've got r as a function of s. Well, the difference of the two, this is, they're, they're both vectors. This is a vector. This is a vector. So the difference between them is going to be a vector as well. And that vector is going to look like this. We'll call it delta r. So um, it is the difference. If we take this vector and subtract this vector, we get this one. And I like to think of it, remember it this way, if I add this one to this one, I get that one. So if I subtract r from both sides, then this vector is this one minus this one. And this uh, yellow or orange vector now represents the numerator of our expression up here. So the next thing we need to do is to put yet another vector in here that's going to look like this. Now what do we have? Well, what I've done, I'll move it down here where it's a little easier to see. What I've done is to take the length of this vector, the delta r vector, that's the numerator, and I've divided it by delta s, which is the length of the arc from this point to this point. 
And when I take a vector and divide by a scalar, I get a vector that points in the same direction as the, the first vector, but its magnitude is reduced by the factor of this distance. So I'm going to put one other thing up here, and that is this, the, the uh, magnitude of our r prime vector. And you can see right now it's a little less than 1, and that makes sense because the straight line distance of delta r is less than the arc distance right here. So when I take this and divide it by that, I'll get a value that's similar to 1, but, but less than 1 because this distance is greater than this one. Okay, let me move this around so you can kind of see the three-dimensional nature of what we're doing. Okay, now next thing I want to do is I want to take some of these labels off to make it a little clearer. So let me take the label off this guy and the label off this guy. All right, so here we have it. Now this, uh, let me reiterate it one more time. Here we have r as a function of s plus delta s, which is this. This is r, a function of s, which is this. The orange vector is the difference, which is our numerator. And then r prime is the whole expression where we've divided delta r by delta s. Now, as before, to find the derivative, what I need to do is find the limit of this expression as delta s goes to 0. So watch what happens when delta s changes and gets smaller. I'll make it gradually smaller. And you'll notice the two vectors get closer and closer together. The value of our delta r vector gets shorter and shorter because it's the difference between the two. But the r prime vector uh, doesn't change much. Its direction's changing, and actually its length is changing too, but not by a great deal, because this is always a ratio, whereas the numerator is an absolute vector. The, the delta r is a ratio of that vector to delta s. So uh, you can see what's happening here. As the two points get together, the arc length gradually becomes closer to the length of delta r. And delta r is gradually approaching a tangent to the curve. So as I move delta s more and more toward 0, the vectors become tangent to the curve. And the ratio between the two eventually becomes 1. So here we've reduced delta s to this infinitesimally small value. And in the process, we now have a, ve a vector um, r prime that is tangent to the curve. And it has a length exactly 1. All right, now watch what happens as I move s. It traces out the curve. And our derivative, the r prime derivative, remains tangent to the curve wherever it goes. And its length remains 1. So we can say that the derivative of a vector with respect to the arc length is a unit vector that is tangent to the curve at all places. So I'll just put this in motion. And we'll watch it sweep out as we look at it from several angles here. The derivative is always tangent to the curve, and it's always unit length. And that's what it means to take the derivative of a position vector with respect to the arc length. So now we know that the derivative of a vector with respect to the arc length is, first of all, tangent to the curve, and secondly, it is of unit length. We represent it this way. The little hat symbol is what we use to represent a unit vector. OK, but what happens if our vector is not a function of the arc length, 
but it is a function of something else, such as another parameter like uh, t, for example. Well, here we're going to use a little trick that you're going to see quite often going forward, and that is if we know the relationship between our new parameter t and the arc length, then we can represent our vector this way. We can say it is also a function of s. But s itself is a function of t. And what I've done is to create a composite function. It's a function of t, but it's also a function of s, which is a function of t. Now let's take the derivative of both sides. Here is simply the derivative of r with respect to t. But on the right-hand side, because I'm dealing with a composite function, I have to use the chain rule. And that means I first take the derivative of r with respect to s, then the derivative of s with respect to t. All right, but I already know what this is from up here. It's simply this guy. Well, that leads us to the fact that this derivative is going to be ds dt times our unit tangent vector. And that, in turn, tells us that the vector we're getting here is going to be parallel to this one. It's a, a vector in the same direction, but it's just not the same length. The, the length is this factor, because here this is a, a length of 1, so we're multiplying by a scalar value. So the length of dr dt is equal to ds dt. So we come away with this conclusion that the, uh, the vector we've derived here is going to also be tangent to the curve, but it will have a length equal to ds dt. Now this clear understanding of what it means to take the derivative of a position vector is essential as we move forward to develop a basis for vector representation. And that's exactly what we'll do in the next video.